The anagram Games and Riddles Nabokov placed in Lolita that disclose information about his incestuous abuse as a boy cannot be understood without taking account of his protracted battle against Sigmund Freud. Freud's influence was at its height in America when Lolita was published in the 1950s. Nabokov's scientific sensibilities were greatly offended by Freud's mythic, dream-ridden, psychoanalytic theories. In interviews, Nabokov derided his arch-enemy as a witch doctor and practitioner of voodooism. I, I can imagine what old Freud would have said. Well, my heart really detests my readers know by now. Nabokov reserves special contempt for Freud's Oedipus complex theory of incest, which regarded memories of incest as fantasies conjured up during early stages of psychosexual development. Within his memoirs, Nabokov scathingly likened Freud's cornerstone theory to the police state of sexual myth. Why do you think Nabokov wrote Lolita? I believe Nabokov had several highly moral reasons for writing Lolita. He wanted to educate the public about the pedophile's warped reality and modus operandi, but more importantly, he wanted to overturn Freud's Oedipus complex theory of incest. Contrary to Freud, Nabokov insists that incest is a very real, albeit hidden, event whereby children are groomed and lured into a sordid underworld by predatory adults. Modern research has confirmed Nabokov's insight that many incest offenders are motivated by pedophilia, a dangerous sexual orientation that can turn children into sex slaves and families into living prisons. Last but not least, Nabokov also wanted to show that boys too can be victims of incest. To overturn Freud's influential paradigm, Nabokov developed a homemade code cannibalizing ideas presented in the psychopathology of everyday life. There Freud argued that seemingly accidental errors in speech translation and even printing indirectly divulge information about secret wishes or traumas. The theory introduced the term Freudian slip into popular culture. Nabokov decided to poke fun at Freud by inserting deliberate confessional blunders into his own memoirs and novels. Nabokov was very familiar with Freud's theory of meaningful speech errors. Characters in novels like Despair, The Gift and Look at the Harlequins refer to type errors, traitorous lacunae and full slips of the tongue. In the notes added to his first translation of Pushkin's epic poem Eugene Onegin, Nabokov warned, Even obvious misprints should be treated gingerly, as they may have been left uncorrected by the author. He later admitted to planting three blunders in Ada, two of which play havoc with gender. Joanne Morgan has drawn attention to a suspicious pattern of errors in Nabokov's autobiography, which converges on the discussion devoted to Uncle Ruka. Nabokov first wrote about Ruka in his 1948 New York article, Portrait of My Uncle. The bulk of this article was later incorporated into the two editions of his memoirs released in 1951. Nabokov's persistent literary focus on adult child sex has raised difficult questions about his sexual orientation. A meaningful error, evident in his memoirs, suggests we have reasons to be concerned. When he was around nine or ten years old, Nabokov recalled how Uncle Ruka would visit him in the nursery, only to collapse into a chair with an ecstatic moan, reading children's books. The author then described his own reactions to rediscovering the French classic Les Malheurs de Sophie on the bookshelves. In the 1948 New Yorker article, he neutrally related, In my own case, when I come upon the books and read again about Sophie's troubles. However, inconclusive evidence he offered this alarmingly different account. In my own case, when I come over Sophie's troubles again, I not only go through the same... This telling blunder suggests Nabokov did indeed indulge in sexual fantasies of a pedophilic nature. 
The significance of Nabokov's blundering strategy is confirmed by the key it provides to his neglected Lolita Riddle. Between 1950 and 1951, Nabokov worked simultaneously on his memoirs, Lolita and Eugene Onegin. This gave him the opportunity to build an interactive pattern of Freudian slips that hides but ultimately reveals scenes of incest involving Uncle Ruka. This time, the crucial mistranslation pivots on the word plain. In his 1948 New Yorker article, Nabokov vividly recalled how Uncle Ruka callously greeted him at the Seversky railway station, complaining about how jeune et laid he had become. He correctly translated Ruka's French into English as sallow and ugly. However, within his compiled memoirs, Nabokov intentionally mistranslated laid as plain. Nabokov made a strikingly similar translation error in his first translation of Eugene Onegin. There, he mistranslated Pushkin's reference to an uncle's simple speeches as plain speeches, prior to detailing secret trysts and initiation rituals held with children. The word tryst adds inappropriate sexual overtones to Pushkin's original phrase, assigned meetings. The significance of the two errors is confirmed by how Nabokov corrected these obvious misprints in his second translation of Eugene Onegin, published in 1975. The revelatory nature of Nabokov's triptych patterns reaches a crescendo in Lolita's crucial QQ passage. There, his twofold nymphette finally reveals how, prior to her fateful encounter with Humbert at the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel, Quilty had already recruited her into a child pornography ring back at summer camp. At the same time, she indicated her molester had some silly name and was just plain silly. The quasi-anagram game and plain clues set against the backdrop of hidden sexual abuse once again implicates Vasily Rukavishnikov, or Uncle Ruka, as Vladimir's incestuous molester. Via his plain key, Nabokov ensured his Lolita riddle could only be solved by attending to the child's account of the traumas they experience in the paedophilic underworld. His ultimate victory over Freud is appropriately secured by allowing the normally silenced child an opportunity to speak. Nabokov was once asked what he wanted his future biographers to pay attention to. In reply, he stipulated, the plain truth of documents is on my side. That and only that is what I would ask of my biographer. Plain facts. No symbol searching. No jumping at attractive but preposterous conclusions. No Marxist bunkum. No Freudian rot. There are strong reasons for concluding that in writing Lolita, Nabokov was engaged in a massive public hoax, a hoax that tragically backfired. What popular culture ended up appropriating from his novel was his portrait of the seductive Lolita, not his critique of Freud or his attempt to expose the pedophile underworld. The novel's disastrous social impact is exemplified by the case of Roman Polanski, who allegedly drugged, raped and sodomized a 13-year-old girl during a 1976 photo shoot. In the ensuing media frenzy, some tabloids denounced the hapless teenager as a wily Lolita. As an encoded and quintessentially riddling text, Lolita demands our urgent re-evaluation. Although Nabokov famously insisted that he had no moral purpose in writing Lolita, in a later interview he expressed very different expectations of his lasting legacy. I really believe that one day a reappraiser will come and declare that far from being a frivolous firebird, I was a rigid moralist. <laughs>